So um, I had originally named this sermon Co-Laboring with the Devil for Our Own Destruction. Um, I thought it was kind of catchy, but honestly, I, I changed it to Breaking Down Strongholds because I want to focus on what God wants to do. So um, our destruction is the problem, but breaking down those strongholds and getting freedom is what we're focusing on. Um, the scripture I'm teaching from today is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So because we're talking about strongholds, I thought, I would go ahead and define that for you. Um, according to the dictionary, um, a fortress, stronghold is a fortress or a strong defense. It's also a place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. Also a place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. When I visualize a fortress, I visualize um, kind of like in the, in the movies you see that big stone fortress up on the edge of a cliff that's carved directly into the, the cliff itself, you know, it just formidable and strong. Um, but what a stronghold really is, what we're focusing on today, is a belief that's strongly upheld in our mind. Because that's, that's actually what it is. Um, it's something that's set up shop here that we've begun to believe in and given strength to. So some examples of... Um, of some strongholds, and this is just a small list. I mean, the, the devil has, has found lots of ways to, um, to come at us, but we've got greed, lust, fear, low self-worth, rejection, lying, unbelief, ungodly thoughts, pride, anger, and lots and lots more. Um, Pastor Dave has told me that this type of sermon I'm giving today is a testimony sermon. I am going to be talking about my testimony a lot. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say, you're going to you're going to think, "Oh, that sounds awful." I'm going to share some really raw things. Oh, they were raw at the time. Um, they're deeply personal and experiences that I've actually gone through. But I want to do that because I think a lot of you can relate, and I want those of you that have experienced this to know that you're not alone. Um, this stronghold I'm talking about in my own life is rejection. And it used to be one of those really strong fortresses. I like to refer to it now as more of a blanket fort. Um, I haven't had 100% victory over it, which is, I think, one of the reasons I decided to share this one. Because I've had other things that I've had victory over, like fear and anxiety. Um, but I want you guys to know we're all human and we're all working through things. So um, there's good news. There's some yucky things that the devil has said to me and yucky ways that he's come out at me, but um, I'm walking in a lot more victory now. And uh, there's a happy ending to all of this, so don't be dismayed. Um, I, I lived most of my life not even understanding that I had rejection issues, uh, but they were such a part of me that they defined me. Um, it took God really speaking to me to, to even make me aware that there was a spiritual issue um, and that there was something that I can do about it. A uh, word of knowledge during prayer uh, a long time ago, many years ago, probably 10 years ago, uh, let me know that this start uh, started in my life when I was still in diapers, really. Um, and you know what? What can you do about something like that when it starts so young? What, what weapons do you have when you're um, kind of targeted by the enemy at that age? But you know what? A lot of us are. The enemy starts really young. There comes a point, though, that when there's something we can do about it. Um, but it, it went on through elementary school. I got teased a lot. Um, I heard a lot about how I wasn't smart enough or good enough. Um, I got teased, I don't know, for being different, except I can't even tell you why they thought I was different. They just did. And I think that was part of the enemy's work. Um, this particular group of boys like to call me it. Um, 
they would make a joke out of it. They would start to refer to me as she. They would be sh she. But then they'd cut it off and they'd say it. And they made my name into a curse word. And they did this relentlessly. I used to go home crying as just a little girl. And, um, you know, I started to identify with that. And, and it started to define me. There was a point early on when I used to fight that kind of um, teasing and that kind of thing. And then there was a point where I just started giving up and kind of agreeing with it. Um, there were things like um, the enemy would come in and whisper, they won't like you, you're not as good as them, you're not as pretty as her. That's a big one for girls, you're not as pretty as her. Um, this is one of the, those raw ones I was talking about. Um, you're fat and repulsive. Uh, I started hearing that when I was about five foot four and 135 pounds. You're fat and repulsive. Um, then as an adult, Things like you're not smart enough to that. There's no way you can do that job. You're not qualified and certainly couldn't learn to be successful at it. Um, look at you. You're disgusting. Nobody wants you. Or you're a bad mom. And as I heard these things, I agreed with every single one of them. Um, and you know, it, it doesn't stop. I, I told you that I've had some victory. And I have. I've had a lot of victory. I don't um, walk around as a person rejected anymore. Um, but even a, a, up to a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing to give this sermon, I was hearing, uh, nobody's going to listen to you. All they're going to see is that you're fat. How about that? That's when I didn't agree with y'all. Um, because I knew I was coming here in this room talking to family. And that's, that's made a difference for me. I just have to tell you guys that. Thank you. So over and over again, I agreed with every horrible thing the enemy whispered in my ear. I agreed with every horrible thing that people said to me. I had this ticker tape. I've talked to you guys about this before. In fact, you probably hear a few things that I've mentioned in front of you before. I'm just going to, we're pulling it all together today. I had this little ticker tape in my head that constantly said, nobody loves you. So I could be sitting there twiddling my thumbs, minding my own business, kind of lost in thought, and become aware that in the back of my head, over and over again, nobody loves you. Nobody loves you. Nobody loves you. It was like always there. Just as a side note, God has removed that from me. Year, years now, I've been free of that. What I have now, when I kind of come to a conscious awareness of what's going on back there, is praise songs just so you know. I know because I've talked to you guys about that before that a lot of you have that ticker tape running through your head. And I don't know what your particular message is, but I know a lot of you have it. And you can get free of that. You can have something else. God will replace it. We, we just have to pursue that. We have to say, I'm, I'm done with this crud. Anyways, side note. So day after day and week after week and year after year, I agreed with every filthy, nasty thing the devil said to me and about me. And brick by brick, I helped him build a stronghold of rejection in my life. Whose fault is it? How did I get to such a low where I wouldn't even pursue, pursue a, a promotion at work? Um, where I was agreeing with people that I'm a bad mom. Um, how did I get to that low? Was it the bullies in ele elementary school that started the whole thing? Um, was it the enemy? You know, the devil whispering in my ear? Was it the teacher in high school that humiliated me in front of the entire class? Um, kind of wrecked the rest of my high school time. A year and a half I spent in his class, slumped over my desk napping because I couldn't bear to lift my head in that class anymore. Was it his fault? Or was it me? Was it the two little words that I put out there, I agree? Did the stronghold get built on a foundation of my agreement with the enemy? Is it because I stopped fighting? Well, let's take a look. What does the Bible say about the devil's character? 
1 Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. So he's a predator who likes to devour. Would you like to guess what he likes to devour on? Our joy, our peace, our faith, our love, our compassion, our mercy. Those are the things he likes to consume and get out of our lives. Um, John 10.10 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and to have it to the full. So he's a thief. He's a murderer. He's a destroyer. This is my favorite because it really speaks to what I'm talking about today. John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil. So we're talking about the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Do you guys get the point of this scripture? What is it trying to tell us? The devil is a liar. So who have we aligned our thoughts with when we receive those things in and agree with them? A liar. So my challenging question to you today is, are we victims? Do we walk around victimized by the enemy? Or are we in rebellion against God? So I do want to just make a, a brief note here, the difference between being victimized in certain circumstances that does happen. It's very real. It's traumatizing. But there's a difference between that and a victim mentality. We can walk around feeling like we have no power, that we've been made a victim, and we put the power in whoever victimized us. Um, I want us to get out of that way of thinking and realize we have a choice. So there is a... Um, I have one more question for us here. What if this whole power structure that's active in our lives shifts when we recognize that we have a choice? So let's talk about God's character, his thoughts towards us, what he wants for us. Uh, just by the way, I, I believe so strongly in the power of the word of God that I like to throw a lot of scriptures in here. And I know I am throwing a lot of scriptures at you, um, but as I speak them, I believe that God uses that. So... Um, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. How many times do we hear that scripture and we're like, yeah, it's a great scripture, and how many of us actually believe it? I would say that we believe it's possible, but is it happening in our own lives? Maybe not. Um, Psalms 86, 15, but you, O Lord, are a God of mercy and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We can believe that about our God. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Um, this is one I brought out as a, um, a declaration. Do you remember a few weeks ago when we did some declarations? I love this one from Deuteronomy 28, 11 through 12. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground, in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open uh, the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. There's some truth to belief, people. Why don't we believe that rather than the filthy lies that the enemy throws at us? Um, last one, Malachi 4.2. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. I love the picture of joy that that paints, because there's a lot of us walking out uh, around with no joy in our lives. I like the promise of joy. So who do we believe, the devil or God our Father? And if we're not believing God our Father, isn't that rebellion? 
If we believe the father of lies, aren't we choosing sides? We're making a choice. So I'd like to point out that when we agree with the enemy, we are putting ourselves into bondage. The longer we agree with him, the stronger the bondage gets. We become volunteer slaves. Satan dupes us into believing he holds the power, but in truth, it's us that gives him that power. So how do we get out of this mess that we helped create? We are all living in some level of bondage. I already talked about getting free from fear and anxiety. So I've had some freedom. I also still have some bondage. I've got um, rejection that I'm still battling against. But we're almost there. There's other ones. God is just going to pick up the next one, bring it to my mind, and we're going to start battling that one. We're just going to do it. But we're all living in some level of bondage, and we may even have promises from the Lord in these areas, and we're wondering, where's my promise? Where's my breakthrough? How many people have been waiting for breakthrough in a particular area of your life? Most of us, right? So I want to I want to emphasize here that the answer is simple, but that doesn't mean that it's very easy to do. Um, it's hard but simple. So let's go back to the original scriptures in Corinthians. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that sets itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So two things I really want to draw out of that. Our warfare is not the standard um, things that we would, it's not the standard strategies, it's not the things we would use out here in, in, in the real world. There's different strategies we have to use when we're fighting a spiritual war. Um, I want to just take a brief aside, and there is a lot of things that happen as a result of strongholds. I believe that strongholds help um, bring and keep disease and illness, um, things that happen mentally, like anxiety, things we would go get medical help for, go see the doctor, that kind of thing. Um, these are th strategies that we use to deal with what's happening to us kind of here in the, in the flesh. Um, these are not the tools that I'm talking about. There, there is a place for that. I know that a lot of us, I have been on anti-anxiety medication in my past, so I'm not saying um, go get off all of your medications and just start crying out to the Lord. Um, but I want to emphasize that there is a way to deal with this that doesn't involve any of that. Um... I like the other part of this that I really want to pull out is um, where we talk about bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Because that's really where the battle is fought, is in our minds, because that's where it starts. Um, so what are our weapons? Uh, the word of God, which is what, truth? Yes? Prayer and worship. Those are the three that I want to talk about. Um, how do we wield our weapons? Uh, one of my favorites is declarations. This has been a year of declarations for me. About a year ago, somebody really, um, well, I was at a conference actually, so it was more than one somebody. They really started talking about, and it started clicking about making declarations over your life. And I like to make declarations straight from the word of God because there's power in that. So I like to make declarations. And we have, as a congregation, gone through and done some of those the last few weeks. Um, for those of you that were here, we did that together. We pulled out some scriptures and just started learning how to do that. Um, because we're dealing with a liar who likes to lie a lot because he's the father of lies, uh, we need to know the truth. So the word of God is one of our weapons. It's filled with truth. Um, I heard somebody speaking about how to spot a counterfeit. Um, so cashiers in banks are 
uh, trained to, to spot counterfeit, but they're not trained by learning what the counterfeit looks like. They are trained by knowing what the actual legitimate bill looks like. So that when something that's not the actual legitimate bill comes across their, their desk, they know that it's a counterfeit. So we recognize the lie by knowing the truth. We know the truth by getting God's word in our hearts. And it, it takes repetition, repetition and it takes purposing ourselves. We have to set aside the time to get into the word of God. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't spend nearly enough time in the word of God as I'm supposed to. And God keeps telling me that. So I'm, I'm doing it more and more. I'm building habits. Um, but how much stronger is my arsenal when I really know the word of God? And I can actually counter the lie of the enemy with his truth. He can send an accusation this way, and I can say, no way, and give him a piece of God's truth right back in his face. Word of God, very important. Um, I like to, to combine the word of God with praying, praying scripture over ourselves, praying scripture over our family. Um, I'd like to talk about one of the, the things that changed my life in my desire to know God more. Um, I decided to pursue him in the best way I knew how. And um, I'd say probably two years ago, uh, I became part of a very small prayer group. It was John Malcolm, myself, and Catherine. And week after week, we all three showed up and prayed for each other. We prayed for One Hope prayed for Pastor Dave, prayed for you all, but we really prayed for each other. We laid hands on each other. We prophesied over each other. Um, I was probably the weak one in the group when it came to that kind of thing, um, but as they let me just exercise those muscles, I got to start using some of the gifts that God was bringing out. I, it was okay to fail in front of them, and, and they kept pouring themselves and their prayers into me. It changed my life. Um, so prayer and prayer for each other is really important. And I would strongly encourage you. I know a lot of you have the LTG groups, the life transformation groups. That's kind of a carryover from Northwest Church, and a lot of you still do that. If you're not part of a very small group of people who will really invest in praying for you, I would suggest you talk to your friends and see what you can do. Um, Worship is another very powerful tool. It changes the atmosphere. So um, there has been times, and even recently in the last few months, times where I have been so low that I've been curled up on my side in the fetal position, um, just crying, uh, because God is bringing stuff out. I've become aware of things, and it... Um, it comes out emotionally, and then God likes to clean it out. But there's been some low points in that process. Um, and all I've been able to do is send a text to one person, please pray for me, I'm in a bad way. Um, and then the other thing that I was able to do in those moments is turn on worship music. Sometimes I haven't even been able to cry out to God. Sometimes I'm just laying there lost in my mess. But those two things, just reaching out to a friend, um, sometimes it was just crying out to God in a raw moment, um, but putting on worship music. When I couldn't do anything else that was good for me, putting on worship music changed the atmosphere of the room, and I found myself calming and, uh, and feeling a whole lot better. So... Sometimes we're so beat up that we don't know what to do. Um, reach out. I know so many of us want to isolate when we're feeling bad, um, but don't do that. Reach out. Even one little person, please pray for me. Um, so what if we can't even reach out to a single person? We could do what I did when I didn't trust a single person with all that raw emotion that I was feeling. Over 10 years ago, I decided that I was tired of letting 
myself make a wreck of my life, and I wanted God to fix it. I didn't even know where to start. So I said, God, I need you to fix my life. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> it was as simple as that. And I just gave him permission to do what he wanted to do in my life. So it's really, it's really important that we make a choice. That's really the thing I want to draw out. We need to start believing what God tells us. We need to make a choice. So we, I still get pestered. I, I mentioned that I'm still getting hammered, right? Um, but I also mentioned I, I cease to agree with it, right? So if I had, I was this close. I didn't. If I had, I would have called Pastor Dave and said, you know what, I'm not ready to give this sermon. I can't, I can't do it. I'll, come, I'll get back to you and I'll tell you when I can do it. And he probably would have said, well, are you sure, Rachel? I think that this is something God is putting together. I'd be like, no, I'm, I'm sure I, got, I can't do it. Because that's how strong the pull was to not get up here and maybe embarrass myself. But do you guys think that I'm embarrassing myself right now? Do you think that was a lie from the enemy? Are you glad I didn't agree with it? All right. This is what we have to start thinking. We can't agree with him anymore. We can't... Oh, I'll get up there even though it is going to be humiliating. We can't just power through. We just got to stop agreeing with it altogether. So um, what I want to do now is have a time of listening for the Holy Spirit. Remember I talked about living most of my life not even understanding that I was living with rejection, that I had a spiritual stronghold in my life. There are a bunch that I'm sure I'm still unaware of that God needs to reveal to me, and I'm absolutely certain every single one of you has at least one that you need to know about, understand what the enemy's been doing, understand where you've been agreeing with him, and then let's get it out. Let's shake up those strongholds. Let's break them down, and let's start walking in victory. Let's start understanding what God says about us. Um... You know, once we understand what God says about us, we understand who we are in him. We understand I'm a daughter of a king. A daughter of a king is a princess. Princesses get to command with authority. What if I started walking in authority? What would that look like? What if I could just tell the devil to go? If I could cast him out and then diseases are healed? and people start walking in freedom, what if that happened in all of our lives here in this room? So, Dan, would you come and play on the piano? And I would love it if you played um, You Won't Relent. I love that one. And um, I'm just going to ask that we just, in our own little bubble in our chairs, just quiet ourselves for a moment and ask God, what do you want to work on? What, do, what garbage, what stronghold am I hanging on to? What have I given power to in my life that you want to set me free from? And then I want to take it a step further. Strongholds bring destruction to our lives. I want the Holy Spirit to show you what's, what's been attached to the stronghold, what has the bondage done to you. Is it that chronic back pain that you've been feeling forever? Is it um, holding you back at work like minded so that you're in poverty perpetually? Um, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring to mind some of the things that the destruction has brought to your life that maybe you'd like to be free from. And then after... Um, we have this kind of quiet moment of contemplation. I'll go ahead and release you guys, but anybody who had something brought to mind and you want prayer for it, and you want prayer for that thing, that sore back, that whatever, the job, whatever it is, whatever the Holy Spirit brings to mind, if you want prayer for that, come on up. And Pastor Dave and I are going to be up here. We'll pray for you. Um, and it, we're going to have just a moment of silence while Dan plays. And then I'm going to pray over you, and then I'll release you, okay? All right.